Volcanoes are a spectacular display of nature's power, with eruptions which are awesome to behold, yet utterly deadly. These infernos of nature can unleash cataclysmic destruction in their wake. From explosive blasts capable of scorching vegetation and landscape for kilometers, that's very deadly, very fast moving, and that will, you've got no chance to escape from it. To towering toxic ash clouds, able to rise tens of thousands of meters into the air and kill animals and humans by suffocation. And if you see an ash cloud rolling towards you, you've probably not got time to escape. Volcanic blasts are so powerful, they have even been known to change the world's climate. Since the 1500s, over a quarter of a million people have been killed by volcanoes. And since the millennium, over 2,000 have lost their lives. It is estimated that volcanic eruptions result in over a billion dollars in global property damage annually. The ruminative force of volcanoes can seem boundless, yet these dragons of nature also provide great benefits. These include the creation of extremely fertile soil, essential for agriculture and farming communities, as well as stunning landscapes. These features have attracted human settlements around volcanic regions throughout history. But such close cohabitation with one of nature's deadliest forces comes at a price. Suddenly, there was a blanket of dark ash came down and covered me. It was so dark that I just couldn't see. I couldn't breathe. With fascinating expert insights and first-hand accounts from survivors, in this episode, we will be looking at volcanoes and eruptions across different parts of the world, including the deadly disasters on Mount Sidabung in Indonesia, Mount Etna in Italy, and Mount Niragongo in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Volcanoes are vents on the surface of a planet or moon from which extremely hot materials such as molten rock and hot gases escape from the interior, causing an eruption. A volcano is a site where there is molten rock from within the Earth that rises towards the surface. Now, the molten rock can leak out and give you lava flows, the molten rock can explode and give you an explosive eruption, or the molten rock can interact with steam and not actually reach the surface itself, but give you a steam-driven eruption. So anywhere where stuff from inside the Earth gets forced out onto the surface, usually builds a mountain, sometimes blasts a hole. But the term volcano doesn't only refer to the vents from which hot lava erupts. It also designates the massive landforms that have emerged over time as a result of volcanic activity. These mountains, birthed from the rocks, ash, and other solidified volcanic debris around the volcano vent, grow into towering peaks and slopes. The resulting volcanoes are classified according to their shape and size. Most significantly, they are classified according to their eruptive patterns, a feature that plays a significant role in volcano monitoring. There are a number of ways of categorizing different types of volcanoes, so we can think of a volcano as a very morphological thing, so the shape of a volcano. The picture postcard volcano is the one which is cone-shaped, uh, the Mount Fuji-style volcano. And then we get our uh, more classical shield type volcanoes so or upturned dishes and we get variations of that in between. So a volcano is really anywhere on the surface that we see the product of volcanic activity and that volcanic activity is the result of the generation of heat at depth and the rising of molten magma to the surface and eventually we see that erupted product and that creates the fantastic shapes and activity that we see uh, on the surface today. One of the most crucial parts of volcano classification is assigning one of three statuses, active, dormant, 
or extinct. If a volcano is labeled as active, it is currently erupting or exhibiting signs of a foreseeable eruption. If it is described as extinct, it is not showing any activity and probably never will. A dormant volcano is one that hasn't erupted for a significant amount of time, although that may change in the near or far future. However, just because a volcano is labeled as dormant doesn't mean it is necessarily any safer than its active counterpart. Mount Sinabung in Indonesia was a volcano that right up to 2010 had not erupted for 400 years and was labeled as dormant. But since then, the mount has experienced a series of deadly eruptions that have taken numerous lives and left thousands displaced. The 8,070-foot Mount Sinabung on the Indonesian island of Sumatra is home to more than 150,000 people. The communities living along the volcano slope take advantage of the fertile soil conditions to grow a range of crops and produce. The mount has been a staple and stable feature on their landscape for centuries and they are dependent on it for their livelihoods. But in 2010, all that rapidly changed when the volcano erupted, killing two people and displacing 30,000 more. This sudden reanimation came as a complete surprise. And according to experts, Mount Sinabung had been monitored less than its more active counterparts. But the violent eruptions that would ensue in 2014 and 2015 would cement the status of Cinnabung as an active volcano and forever change the lives of the inhabitants who had made their home around it for so many generations. On the 1st of February 2014, the mount erupted again, spewing out a plume of hot ash, gas and rocks that reached up to 3,000 meters into the sky. The deadly blast killed at least 14 people, including three school children and a teacher. The deaths were caused by fast-moving toxic pyroclastic ash clouds, which engulfed surrounding villages. These deadly clouds, termed pyroclastic flows, made the eruption of Mount Cinnabung particularly violent. Pyroclastic flows are the most dangerous and deadly elements in an explosive volcanic blast. Capable of moving at speeds of up to 720 kilometers per hour and at temperatures known to reach 700 degrees, they incinerate everything in their path. It was a pyroclastic flow that destroyed the Roman city of Pompeii in AD 79 and which claimed nearly 30,000 lives on the Caribbean island of Martinique in 1902. A pyroclastic flow is an avalanche of lava blocks, um, volcanic ash, frag finely fragmented volcanic material, and volcanic gases that cascade down the side of a volcano, like an avalanche does, like a snow avalanche does almost. It's also accompanied by a big sort of turbulent ash cloud that rolls over the top of the dense basal avalanche at the, ba at the base of the flow. So when you're looking at these um, pyroclastic flows from a distance, hopefully, you see these sort of boiling ash clouds. The bit that you don't see is at the base of these currents, sort of, uh, thick accumulations of coarse material that can be very destructive. They can burn people that get trapped in them. They can destroy houses and infrastructure because there's a lot of coarse material in them as well. Um, so they essentially just bulldoze um, buildings over and they can bury uh, buildings and towns as well. It's hot and it's fast moving. You know, moving at 80, 90 kilometers an hour, you can't get out of the way. And um, if you're caught in a blast of hot ash and hot air, um, you basically burn to death. The ferocity and scorching heat of these pyroclastic flows meant that rescue workers had to wait and could not get close to Mount Cinnabung immediately. 
When they were finally able to approach the volcanic peaks, they were faced with bodies buried deep in ash. The disaster had a severe effect on the economy as farmers lost their crops, resulting in increased food prices. Sadly, this would not be the only volcanic disaster to bring the region to its knees. In June 2015, just a year after the deadly eruption, the Mount Sinabung volcano exploded once again. A series of violent eruptions lasting over the course of a few days rocked the region. On the first day, the volcano erupted three times in only a few hours. Volcanic ash blanketed parts of Medan, the provincial capital of North Sumatra, about 50 kilometers from the volcano. Residents were forced to wear masks as winds carried smoke towards the city. Authorities raised the alert status of Mount Sinabung to the highest level. Sinabung spewed out rocks and hot gas over a distance of three kilometers incessantly. Dense ash that was up to two millimeters thick covered roads and homes located 15 kilometers away. Eyewitnesses described an almost apocalyptic scene of a dark cloud of smoke covering the entire sun. Up to 28 pyroclastic flows were observed in one day. The Center for Volcanology and Geological Hazard Mitigation declared all areas within a minimum radius of three kilometers from the summit of Mount Sinabung a danger zone. As a response to the severity of the situation, authorities initiated the immediate evacuation of the region. Eyewitnesses described scenes of several thousands of people, including women with infants in slings transported down the mountain in police trucks. Others made their way down the charred slopes on motorcycles with faces smothered in ash. At least 10,000 people were evacuated. Many were housed in temporary shelters already under pressure due to the 20,000 people already displaced from the volcanic eruption of the previous year. These refugee camps faced huge humanitarian pressures with urgent need for beddings, toiletries, clothing, food, water tanks, and psychologists for trauma healing. However, many of the villagers on Mount Sinabung were reluctant to abandon the fertile soil of the volcanic slopes, which provides their livelihoods. The volcano slope had been a key economic source helping the community grow diverse cash crops such as chilies, oranges, cocoa and coffee. Some people have no choice about living near volcanoes. If you're in a part of the world where you've got subduction going on, one plate going below another, there's going to be a line of volcanoes. Um, volcanic land is often quite fertile because you're bringing fresh minerals to the surface, so when it's mature enough to start growing crops on, you can get a good yield. Uh, so volcanic land is, 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 can be quite good for farming, but it comes with the risk that there'll be another eruption. For days, authorities had pleaded with villagers in the main danger zone to evacuate. But according to the local disaster mitigation agency, only 10,000 of about 33,000 people living within the danger zone had moved a safe distance away into tent camps or government buildings. Luckily, unlike in 2014, no injuries were recorded from the disaster. But the cost and toll of this latest volcanic event, following so quickly on the heels of the previous year's eruption, was a serious blow for a community already on its knees. So what exactly triggered these explosive eruptions on a volcano that had stood dormant for the past four centuries? 
The answer seems to lie in the location itself of Mount Cinnabar on the Ring of Fire. The Ring of Fire is essentially a, a geographical feature whereby you have lots of different active volcanoes in a, in a very ring-shaped pattern. Indonesia is positioned on the Ring of Fire, an arc of fault lines in the Pacific Ocean that frequently experiences volcanic activity. Mount Sinabung is among about 130 active volcanoes in the country. Most volcanoes are in seismically active parts of the world because the process that produces earthquakes is often the same process that causes molten rock to be generated. The formation of magma is deeper down as the rocks are dragged into the earth and they encounter conditions which cause melting to occur or they release seawater into the rocks above and that melts them. The, the melt generation process is a slow ongoing process and you need a large amount of molten rock magma to approach the surface to give you a volcanic eruption. And the magma rising towards the surface under a volcano um, doesn't move smoothly. It can vibrate the rock as it moves. So you get volcanic earthquakes as well. Tiny earth tremors, which if it's close to the surface, sometimes local people can feel. We can certainly detect it instrumentally. So you look for these volcanic earthquakes as the rock fractures or the magma moves or the gas moves from the rock vibrating it. And if those signals get closer to the surface, that's a very good warning sign that an eruption might be imminent. So volcanoes are often seismically, earth tremorly alive before anything starts erupting. And, you know, that's a good sign that something's happening. White Island is a volcano situated in the Bay of Plenty in New Zealand. Most of the volcanic edifice is submerged underwater, but the main crater is above sea level, jutting out majestically in the bay. It is one of the most active volcanoes in New Zealand and has seen multiple eruptions between 1998 and 2001. However, this hasn't deterred the booming tourism industry that had sprung up around it. Being at a volcano is one of the most awe-inspiring things you can do. Being at a, an erupting volcano, one which is possible to see the activity glowing at night, for example, is just simply awe-inspiring. And it's a bit of a rush as you're up there watching this activity progress through time. The privately owned island was a major tourist destination with boat tours to the volcanic landmass happening daily. As part of these expeditions, tourists could go to the island and actually walk inside the main active volcano's crater. However, with popular routine visits to active volcanoes like White Island, comes the risk of tour operators and tourists being lulled into a false sense of security. So some of these tourists are, um, you know, adventure tourists. They, they are going uh, for the thrill, and just as people might go climbing or doing some other very dangerous sports, it's not, it doesn't necessarily appeal to all of us, but I guess in my mind it's okay if people are absolutely informed about what the risks are. And um, I think that's the question. Did those people understand um, the risk that they may have been putting themselves at by going to those places? For the White Island tours, people were given protective equipment, like gas masks and helmets, when exploring the crater. But these precautions proved defenseless in the face of the volcanic disaster in 2019. On the 9th of December, 2019, at the start of the Christmas festive period, a tourist tour group was engulfed in a volcanic disaster. White Island erupted in two explosions following on in quick succession. The series of violent blasts flung ash over 3,600 meters into the sky, showering the volcano's floor with hot debris. If you're caught underneath a very big eruption, the sky can go black. If you've got a big cloud of ash above you and ash starts raining down, you're in darkness and uh, your car headlights, if you're trying to flee, don't penetrate through the murk because you've got all this ash falling and you're ingesting ash into the engines. Trying to flee, if you're in that situation, it's too late. Probably the best thing you can do is get under cover and stay there and hope the roof over your head doesn't collapse. It's horrible to be caught in a really big volcanic eruption. 
In Fakitani town, 50 kilometers across the ocean, smoke could be seen rising from White Island. 47 people had been on the island when the blast went off. We know that reunification won't ease that sense of loss or grief, um, because I don't think anything can. But we felt an enormous duty of care as New Zealanders to make sure that we brought their family members back. Of the 47, 20 people were killed and 27 were injured with serious burns. Casualties came from all over the world, including the UK, US, China, Malaysia, Australia, and New Zealand. Rescue operations proved extremely difficult in such volatile volcanic conditions. New Zealand police dive team, supported by the uh, Defence Force personnel, deployed today. Um, they haven't found anybody as yet. Although in the immediate aftermath of the disaster, some survivors were rescued by boat and helicopter, hazardous situations meant that further rescue operations had to be put on hold. Of course I'm worried. I would be inhuman if I did not worry. I have to emphasize that the risk has not gone. The risk remains present. But reconnaissance flights that did get close to the volcano initially detected no signs of life there. Prior to the eruption, the volcano had been well monitored. Scientists had been keeping a steady watch to try and spot any signs or indications of an impending explosion, but nothing major was detected. This is attributed to the complex submarine structure type of the volcano. According to experts, the volcano is highly ebullient, engaging in a variety of eruption styles. This makes it a complex brew that is difficult to predict. These eruptions are driven by superheated steam and ash, rather than lava being shot out of the magma chamber, which can make them difficult to predict. White Island is a submarine volcano with only the summit crater exposed to the surface. So if we had an eruption which was driven by magma, so a magmatic eruption, there are a number of things that we can look for which can tell us a little bit about the state of that volcanic system. So if we can think about measuring the gases that are coming out the top of the volcano, is there an increase of these before an eruption or is there a decrease? We can think about looking at the seismic signals that that volcano is producing through time. We can also think about how that volcano is deforming, so um, inflating or deflating or, or tilting, if you like. At White Island, the difficulty comes because none of these precursory events may happen leading up to an eruption, so it becomes very difficult to understand um, what may happen through time. Phreatic steam-type eruptions can happen so fast that there is no time to react to events. The deadly combination of falling rocks, wet debris jets, and scorching air can also cause life-threatening harm. Questions are still being asked about the White Island disaster and why tourists were allowed to approach New Zealand's most active volcano. With these volcanoes that tend to be um, quite persistently active and sometimes uh, heavily visited by tourists, um, the problem, of course, is when those volcanoes do something that they don't normally do, or they do something that they do just every once in a while, maybe every few months or maybe every few years. It would be interesting to know, for example, if the tourists in White Island um, were aware that some of the places that they might visit on their tour are places that um, volcanologists who work for the institutions responsible for monitoring the same volcano would not go to because it would be deemed too high risk for them. One defense has been the idea of freedom of choice and freedom of access. Geological hazard monitors, GeoNet, relayed data and information around volcanic activity to tour operators and the police. But some say that the decision to visit or not ultimately lies with tourists. The interaction between volcanoes and the tourism industry is a difficult and fraught one. 
The dangers of having people in such close proximity to active volcano sites, as evidenced by White Island, cannot be underestimated. But it can be difficult to navigate this relationship in lower income countries, who are increasingly dependent on the economic boost of a tourism industry around their volcanic sites. Mount Niragongo in the Democratic Republic of Congo is one such example. The mount, respectfully known by the local community as General Niragongo, is an active 3,470 meter peak north of the town of Goma, near Congo's border with Rwanda, a region that has experienced a series of conflicts and unrest. Niragongo has the largest lava lake in the world and is one of the most volatile volcanoes. But in recent years, it has become a popular tourist destination. Volcanoes, because they are often mountainous and are in mountainous parts of the world, the scenery is beautiful. So people just go and hike and enjoy the scenery. And if it's a volcano that's recently been active, there's usually interesting rock formations to see. There's a sulfurous smell, maybe hot springs, or maybe some small eruptions going on, which usually are quite safe to watch from a range of a few hundred meters. So they attract people. The trouble is that just now and then, there's a big of an expected eruption, and that's what can kill people who've gone there to experience it, and they just get unlucky. Virunga, Africa's oldest national park, started offering tours to the volcanic region in 2014. Since then, the volcanic tour has become one of the park's most popular attractions and is set to increase exponentially as more foreign operators add the tour to their packages. For a region still recovering from the effects of past conflicts, this influx of tourism and potential investment is a much needed and sought after economic boost. But despite the increased prosperity that Mount Niragongo may attract to the Congo, it still remains one of the world's most dangerous peaks. In 1977, it experienced a sizable eruption that killed 400 people and left 400 homes and 10 kilometers of roads destroyed. On the morning of January the 17th, 2002, the great mountain would erupt once again with devastating consequences for the local community. That morning, rivers of liquid lava came spewing down the sides of the volcano. One of these rivers spilled into the town of Goma, burning swathes of jungle and properties in its path. Large smoke plumes created by the eruption similarly endangered the region's famed wildlife, including its mountain gorillas living in the nearby peaks of Mount Niamoragira. The mountain gorillas are critically endangered and over half of the population reside in the Virunga Mountains. The disaster also caused substantial socio-economic disruption. 13% of Goma City was ravaged. There are about 150,000 people who did not leave the town of Goma. Uh, an additional 250,000 left to, to, uh, to Rwanda. And uh, 100,000 people went a bit west, which in a place called uh, Sake. The World Health Organization estimated that close to 15,000 homes were destroyed and 400,000 people were displaced by the disaster. Most of the locals who were displaced are still unable to rebuild homes on the original sites as these have been buried underneath the lava field. For a country with an already struggling economy, the volcanic eruption was a major blow, creating a huge depression for businesses in the region and leading to mass unemployment at the time. Whether a volcano is dangerous or not depends a lot about what's happened at that individual volcano. So volcanic activity and volcanoes in particular, they have their own characteristics. So I like to think of volcanoes as having their own personality. Each one behaves differently through time. So 
about understanding the risk that individual volcano poses is about understanding what that volcano does through time, which is very different at each volcano. So whilst one volcano may be very safe to visit, it hasn't had eruption in hundreds or thousands of years, or by less safe, I mean there's less probability of an eruption occurring, there might be others which have more frequent, more risky activities, which will be higher probability of getting caught up in something dangerous. Different volcano monitoring strategies, which are better able to predict these changing eruptive patterns, will have to be put in place in order to safeguard the local community and the increasing visitors to the mount from future disasters. Well, there's no such thing as a typical volcanic eruption. I've stood next to lava flows. And you can feel the heat if you're close, but they, they will trundle by you and you can see the rock pleating over. And it's beautiful, it's fascinating. And there'll be a smell, there's usually a sulfurous smell, and you can hear little cracky poppy noises as the, the surface chills to glass and the glass flakes plink away. It's, it's, it's great to be near an eruption like that, but an explosive eruption that's roaring out of a vent. You've got a sound like a jet engine. And you've got bangs as individual explosions occur, which are big bubbles bursting. But you don't want to be too close to that kind of thing because it could be brick-sized lumps of rock flying through the air. And even if you've got a hard hat on, you know, one of those hits you, you've got a serious head injury. And if an ash column gets too dense to support itself and collapses back to the ground. It doesn't just sit there, it rushes downhill and you get what's called a pyroclastic flow. Since the eruption, the number of seismographs in the region has increased. This vital technology, which is able to signal impending eruptions, will hopefully allow scientists in the region to be able to warn the public in advance. So an earthquake at its most fundamental is caused by rocks breaking and moving past each other. So in the example where you have a volcano, you might have a, a magma chamber under the ground that's underneath the kind of main volcanic cone. And if magma from the magma chamber starts moving towards the surface, that's gonna cause small earthquakes to occur as it moves up through the volcano. So you can actually track the movement of magma through volcanoes by using earthquakes and using kind of dense networks of seismometers that measure the ground motion from earthquakes in a volcano to, to try and forecast when a volcanic eruption is going to occur. Volcanoes are one of the most mercurial elements of nature. And as we've seen, when we add human interactions to the mix, the results are deadly. Volcanic monitoring is at an advanced stage, with seismographs and supercomputers, in some instances, able to offer early predictions to facilitate evacuations. However, as we've seen in various parts of the world, the geological benefits and stunning sites that volcanoes provide can make them hard for us to resist. We do not always heed the warnings and human complacency in the face of such a devastating force is deadly. The tourism industry and its interaction around volcanic sites is something that will need to be re-evaluated in the future if we hope to prevent disasters such as the one witnessed in New Zealand. Yellowstone is one such site where there has been speculation and discussions around tourism monitoring. Yellowstone National Park is one of the most popular natural reserves in the world. Four million people travel to the park every year to view untrammeled vistas, glimpse untamed animal life, and get close to hot gushing geysers and simmering thermal springs. Yellowstone also houses approximately 10,000 geysers, hot springs and mud spots. It is a unique geothermal hotspot. However, the stunning natural reserve that attracts so many also comes with its hazards for unwary visitors. Apart from the obvious dangers of its wildlife and famed grizzly bears, 
its unique geothermal features also pose serious risks. Through the years, a number of scalding accidents have been reported, often a result of visitors getting too close to Giza basins. But perhaps the biggest threat of all is one that has not yet happened and lies beneath Yellowstone. The National Park sits atop a supervolcano. Supervolcanoes are described as volcanic centers that have had eruptions covering more than 1,000 cubic kilometers. Yellowstone has had three major eruption events in the past 2.1 million years that have led to the creation of large volcanic craters. When this volcano last erupted 630,000 years ago, it had a massive eruption that formed a giant caldera. A caldera is a large circular or oval depression caused by the collapse of the surface following magma removal. The last one formed by Yellowstone's eruption measured approximately 45 by 76 kilometers in size. But although Yellowstone has not erupted for so many years and may seem extinct, evidence of an active volcanic state can be witnessed in hydrothermal activity in the area. Geothermal features and hot springs are one of the key elements of volcanic activity. They are the products of interaction of groundwater with magma at shallow depths. Volcanoes are really, really deadly if you're close to one when it erupts. Now, what do I mean by close? It depends on how big the eruption is. The worst possible case is an eruption of something like Yellowstone. They're sometimes called supervolcanoes. Um, a large caldera where you've got a magma chamber 10 or more kilometers across. If that breaks through to the surface and all the gas escapes, you can get a column of ash rising into the sky and pyroclastic flows sweeping out hundreds of kilometers in all directions and an ash cloud which will spread around the world and block out the sunlight. And then you, you lose your wheat crop for two or three years. That's mass starvation. That's end of civilization stuff potentially. The total heat flux from Yellowstone's geothermal features is estimated to be around a staggering 300 million watts. This high geothermal activity in the area has led to researchers investigating when the supervolcano might erupt once again. An eruption is not expected to happen anytime soon, or at least not in the next thousand years. But according to research from 2017, the volcano's transition to active status might happen faster than we expect. And given the unpredicted eruptions at Mount Sinabung, Mount Niragongo, and White Island, we may have to pay closer attention. So what might happen if Yellowstone were to erupt again? If it did erupt, it could be a devastating disaster for the entire surrounding regions in the US. An eruption could lead to a deadly pyroclastic flow made up of molten lava measuring more than 1,000 degrees. It could also lead to the formation of toxic ash clouds that would expand over 800 kilometers. This thick ash would also likely cover the ground and measure up to 10 centimeters thick, which could potentially destroy crop growth in the Midwest of America. Along with the ash, the supervolcano could release a range of equally toxic gases, including sulfur dioxide, a gas that can lead to acid rain and global cooling. However, such an eruption, although devastating on a large scale, especially for the western region of the USA, would be unlikely to wipe out human life. Another popular volcano, which is also being very closely monitored, is the notoriously active Mount Etna in Italy. The volcano is situated on active tectonic plates and sits on the boundary of the African plate, subducting underneath the Eurasian plate. This has made the volcano a hotbed for volcanic activity over its long history. Etna, which means I burn in Greek, is the largest of the three active volcanoes in Italy. 
Standing at a colossal 3,320 meters above sea level and two and a half times the size of Vesuvius, Mount Etna is the highest active volcano in Europe. Since ancient times, Etna's ebullient activity has continued incessantly. This constant volcanic activity helped attract some of the earliest traveling geologists and birthed some of our first insights into the origins of volcanoes. Careful observations by these early geologists of ancient lava flow helped develop our understanding of how solidified lava and ash added to the construction of stratovolcanoes over time. But despite its hyperactivity, Mount Etna, like the other volcanoes we've looked at, continues to attract a large human presence. Its fertile volcanic soil benefits the extensive agricultural activity on its lower slopes, from vineyards and orchards to olive groves and citrus plantations. Its lower slopes are also home to several popular settlements and communities, including the city of Catania. Approximately 25% of Sicily's population lives on the slopes of Mount Etna. Its rich history and stunning scenery also attracts its fair share of tourists, with thousands flocking to the volcano every year. This human presence, combined with Etna's high volcanic activity, has led to a number of deadly incidents through the centuries. In the 20th century, Etna's hyperactivity continued. The 1920s saw a series of eruptions, including a major one in 1928. In November of that year, an explosive eruption led to the destruction of Mascali, a town located on the eastern flank of the volcano. The next explosion that would rock the volatile mount would be in 1950. In the festive month of December that year, disaster struck. A titanic wall of scorching molten lava, measuring nearly 10 meters high, surged down Mount Etna. The incendiary landslide blazed through villages on the volcano's lower slopes, torching houses in its path. Inhabitants, again, were able to evacuate successfully, and no loss of life was recorded, but they were left devastated by the loss of their homes and cherished farmlands. The lava is reported to have burned through the villages, turning vegetation, including chestnut groves, apple orchards, vineyards, and trees into flaming torches. Eruptions continued through the following decades, including the 70s and 80s. In 1983, a breakthrough was made in the strategies used to divert volcanic lava. During an eruption in 1983, Italian scientists managed to persuade the government at the time that a direct intervention to halt the volcanic process was needed. Explosives and earthen barriers were used with some success to divert the oncoming lava flow. This feat wasn't recognized as a resounding breakthrough at the time, but it would be the first successful intervention that would pave the way for many more in the future. Eruptions continued through the following decades, including a series of violent outbursts in the late 90s. Today, in the 21st century, Mount Etna remains as active as ever, with recent activity in 2017 and 2019. In 2017, after a few fairly quiet years, the volcano experienced a phreatic eruption at the time, about 35 tourists and their guides had been visiting the mountain when the explosion happened. The eruption shot lava and rocks 198 meters into the air and did cause some harm, leaving 10 injured. In 2019, more activity was witnessed on the Great Mountain. Italy's National Institute of Geophysics and Volcanology tweeted about a series of Strombolian eruptions that occurred on the volcano in May. Strombolian eruptions are named after the Stromboli volcano, an active volcano on the Aeolian Islands. This type of eruption can spurt jets of lava tens or even hundreds of meters high. But in this event, the eruptions were minor. 
with some spluttering of volcanic material landing on the mount's slopes. What was significant about this event was the fact that the eruption occurred on the flank of the volcano and not its summit. A flank eruption on the mountain the year before had been the first for a decade. Explosive flank eruptions pose a real threat as they lead to lava floods, landslides, and potentially deadly pyroclastic flows. Although this recent flankside eruption was concerning, there was some reassurance in the fact that Mount Etna is constantly monitored. Etna is one of the most studied volcanoes in the world, with a long history of observation. I've been on Etna when it's been erupting explosively, a substantial ash column rising from the vent and stuff falling on the ground a few hundred yards in front of me. And it's, it, to be honest, it's exhilarating. That's fine when it stays at that level, but if the eruption intensifies, um, then I imagine it is terrifying because I would know the consequences. <laughs> that could be coming my way. I'd hate to be in that situation because there's not a lot you can do if you're too close. There are currently three observatories set up on its slopes, with Italy's National Institute of Geophysics and Volcanology constantly keeping a close watch. There has also been significant development in technology around volcano detection and monitoring that has emerged around Etna. The use of airborne volcano ash trackers, for instance, have helped aircrafts learn to navigate around volcanoes and avoid the disruption of grounding planes and shutting down airports for extended periods during volcanic activity. New automated warning systems also help predict imminent volcanic eruptions. Mount Etna, with its long history of volcanic activity, has provided great opportunities for volcanic studies and the development of technology around monitoring and managing eruptions. But despite the observations and introduction of volcanic monitoring devices, Etna's enigmatic eruptive pattern and myriad of eruptive styles makes it difficult to rule out the future threat of an unpredicted eruption. The tragic events around volcanoes in Indonesia, Italy, New Zealand and the Congo prove that we cannot be complacent in the face of potential volcanic eruption. A dormant or even extinct volcano can reanimate at any time, and a tourist tour along a scenic route could quickly turn into a deadly eruption zone. You can have intervals of repose lasting several hundred years between one eruption and another. And those are the worst volcanoes uh, to deal with because um, if a volcano has done nothing for hundreds of years, the local people will regard it as safe. My grandfather lived here, he never had, had any problem, why should I move out? And even if there are warning signs building up, it's very hard to convince people. Although technology is advanced in volcano monitoring, there is still a lot for us to learn in understanding more complex volcanic patterns so that seemingly invisible signals are not missed. Volcanoes are terrifyingly awesome, and we are drawn to them like moths to a flame. Deadly disasters.